Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the School World Order. I am your host, the Dallas Professor John Kleisick, author of School World Order, the Technocratic Globalization of Corporatized Education. Welcome everybody to the School World Order. I have today a special pleasure of uh, hosting uh, Walter Rieger from Germany and also Luigi Posto from Italy. They are part of the Graphical User Interface Collective. Um, they had me on their show last time. And so this time uh, they're coming on my little show uh, to do a little follow-up discussion. So uh, if I can introduce these two gentlemen to you. Uh, Walter Rieger studied philosophy and linguistics in Germany. He received his PhD on the topic of the philosophy of plural logic is currently working on logics for fine-grained meanings in a research project at a German university focusing on impossible world semantics for epistemic logics. In addition to these academic shenanigans, he finds time for really important topics such as the historical analysis of capitalism, empirical power structure research, and research into the theory of democracy. Luigi Posto is a musician, uh, in particular, he is a multi-instrumentalist that includes drums and percussion, piano and clarinet. He's also a composer and an improviser who has studied jazz and improvised music at music academies in Italy, Germany, and Latvia, and has given concerts in Central Europe, New York, and Cuba. His main political interest in the, is in the history and present uh, manifestations of neoliberalism. For GUI, Graphical User Interface Collective, he produces political songs, podcasts, and readings on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, on neo-racism, neoliberalism, and popular sovereignty. He currently lives and works in a refuge in the Dolomites. And a little bit of background about uh, the Graphical User Interface Collective. Uh, GUI is a collective of artists and scientists founded in 2021. Its goal is to provide basic knowledge through artistic and scientific communication regarding the prevailing power structures, as well as the nature of democracy. So why is GUI pursuing this outline project? Knowledge about power and democracy is on the wane in the majority populations of the West. At the same time, capitalist democracies are transforming more and more openly into authoritarian systems. The autocratic direction in which this global autocratization process is heading is becoming clear to more and more people in Western countries, leading to an increased potential for outrage in society's concern. However, this potential for resistance lacks the relevant concepts of power and democracy to even adequately classify current events and identify possible alternatives for resistance. Social indignation, however, can only stabilize into efficient democratic resistance if it is based on adequate theories about power, capitalism, and democracy. Outrage without concepts is blind. And that is a good description of the context for our discussion today. So uh, as last time that I was on uh, the GUI Collectives podcast uh, to discuss my book here, uh, which is not up behind me today, <laughs> Cool World Order, um, we had some, uh, some really good conversation. They tossed out some challenging questions in terms of my analysis of socialism, uh, fasc fascism, capitalism, and also Hegelianism. Uh, and at the time, my instinct was kind of to, to ask some questions, like to answer your question with a question. But since I was being interviewed, I felt like I should try to answer it, but I really couldn't answer it without asking some of those questions and, and having a, a dialogue about our definitions of these terms, which is exactly sort of what, um, what your preface to the GUI is, is trying to explore, right? And so, um, so you all were kind enough to come back over here so that we could actually have that conversation in detail. Um, and so, you know, I just like to emphasize right up front that, um, you know, my goal here is to understand your framework better and hopefully to try to find some common ground upon which we can build. Um, and so with no further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. So these, we're gonna start off really simple with just some basic definitions of some of these terms and then eventually we'll come back to um, some of the particular questions where we sort of had a back and forth last time, okay? So, um, so the very first question 
Um, basically, let's get a basic definition of capitalism and then a basic definition of socialism. And in doing so, if you all can distinguish whether you whether socialism is distinct from communism and whether capitalism is distinct from fascism in doing so. So you can start just one piece at a time or, or if you want to synthesize all that together, um, whichever is easier for you and whoever wants to take it up first. Okay, then I'll tackle the first thing here. Um, capitalism, as we take it, is a specific way of appropriating surplus products in the sense of Marx. Now, there have been, of course, pre-capitalist ways of appropriating surplus products, such as in the, the antiquity or in feudalism. But in capitalism, the, the way of, of appropriation takes a quite specific form. And that has to do with a um, really revolution, revolutionary notion of uh, property, uh, especially a, a concept of private property, which um, is then the background for a totally new way of organizing labor, namely, namely the so-called uh, wage labor relation. Um, so how does capitalism then uh, achieve its very specific way of appropriating surplus um, products? Well, according to Marx, the effect of uh, this new concept of property is that a large proportion of uh, society, mainly originally in the rural areas of England, was expropriated from their um, immediate means of rural production. And a sort of market context, an integrated market context was established where a sort of trials was established between landlords, tenants, and um, exploited um, uh, sort of farmer workers. And what we can see here is that as a result of this uh, resulting market, a very stringent market imperatives took place and transformed what was once pre-capitalist labor into a sort of commodity, right? So the essential implication of wage labor here is that labor becomes a, a commodity with a certain exchange value, as Marx calls it, and a certain utility value, as Marx calls it. And exploitation is now achieved in a very specific way. We have a sort of bifurcation of the, um, of the uh, instance, which is the appropriator of the value, that's the private capitalist somehow, and on the other hand, we have the um, modern state with its centralizing power and its uh, monopoly in, in, in violence. And the state somehow gives a stable framework of law and of uh, executive powers to guarantee the expropriation of, uh, of labor forces and the uh, surplus value extraction. And the private capitalist uh, extracts the surplus value. And how is it works is a quite complicated matter, but to bring it down very shortly is somehow to say that uh, that or shall I say labor as, this, as, as, as a sort of commodity has a unique property among all commodities according to Marx, that it has a utility value which can transcend its uh, exchange value. And the only thing that capitalism um, needs to be somehow internally legal is to uh, guarantee that the uh, labor forces get for their um, get for their done, work done the appropriate um, uh, wage, which is then equivalent to their to the um, to the um, exchange value of the of the, of the uh, labor um, executed. Right. So we have the so exploitation then in capitalism somehow means that utility value is higher than um, than uh, exchange value. And it's internally legal. Um, there's nothing really immoral internally to the system to it because, uh, as I just said, um, exchange value is fully compensated by uh, the wage itself, right? So it's in a nutshell is the concept of capitalism, which originates from Marx. Okay, so so a couple of things I'm hearing you say here is that two things through definition of capitalism that are key are um, surplus value, surplus uh, pro production, 
and also um, the exploitation of labor as a commodity in a way that it is not equal to its utility value in terms of its exchange. These are these two are key beyond the concept. Other people might just look at something like free markets or a system of private exchange and um, um, individualized um, exchange. Um, you're saying that more important than those elements uh, would be the the uh, exploitation of labor in a in a system that produces surplus value. Am I correct in hearing that? Yeah, I mean it's uh, due to the new system of property uh, rights. The exploitation has a very very specific form. Um, some Marxists uh, like Alan Bakes and Swood also try to characterize capitalism more in relation uh, or more in terms of a power relation. Um, that may make my, my points more clear. According to her, capitalism emerge, emerges as a sort of division between what she calls state power and class power, right? And class power is the power of segments of uh, the society to appropriate surplus products, right? And uh, state power is then the, um, the monopoly in violence, right? And until the advent of capitalism in rural England, uh, we have it in England, for instance, that uh, both segments of, of power coincide, right? It's the same entity. So in feudalism, for instance, you have a situation that the landlord uh, who uh, extracts surplus value from the, from the vessels uh, also has at his disposal uh, the, the coercive means to do so, so weapons or sort of paramilitary forces. But in capitalism, both things fall apart. Um, and that's due to the uh, innovation and in property rights uh, development. And the private, so-called private sector then, which emerges uh, just then, is the appropriating class of non-producers. And these don't, don't have the, the, uh, the, the coercive forces themselves, right? But the surrounding context and the coercive forces is um, provided by the state itself, but what, what supplants the coercive uh, or the lack of coercive forces for the private appropriators is a very stringent system of economic imperatives. And this, is, this results from the advent of uh, wage labor. So to survive in capitalism, uh, you have to sell your wage labor on, on the market, right? So you have to be exploited. That's another way of putting it more, more in terms of a power relation maybe, it helps. Okay, th thanks. Lu Lu Luigi, do you want to add to that before I comment a little bit? Well, I think that Walter laid it out pretty good. I mean, especially in the sense that capitalism has to be understood as a certain form of a power system, which he did quite clear. Other than that, I mean, the basic elements of capitalism as I see them, even in, in harmony with what Walter said, I mean, of course, the means of production, which are essential in capitalism, especially in contrast to socialism, as we see later, the means of production in capitalism, they are, they are in private ownership, which is connected to the transformation of laws, which uh, hinted Walter Rieger out. Obviously, capitalism, as we look at it in maybe the common way, involves always a certain kind of ideology of freedom, that ideology of freedom maybe has to be understood quite clear. It is the freedom of the capitalists who are able to act in their own interests in the sense of their businesses and investments. It is not any kind of freedom connected to the workers who have to sell themselves on the market to survive, which is then, as we see later, connected to 
to democracy as the contrast. Um, Maybe I can could just ask one uh, at, at one point, uh, Walter, uh, Walter. Luigi just mentioned the uh, notion of freedom and capitalism. I mean, when we consider U.S. history, and this will be quite interesting for our con conversation, I think there is something ideologically which is very interesting above all concerning slavery in the U.S., for instance, and, the, yeah, and, I, and I think this holds quite generally for capitalism, at least in, in English-speaking countries. Um, when slavery was abolished in in uh, in the U.S., um, this was very soon simply sub, um, how shall I say replaced, or it yeah, or uh, how shall I say complemented by the notion that now uh, people are free, no slaves anymore, because um, they are they, they are working on the a sort of uh, work treaties, right? There are some, certain work contracts that somehow uh, supposedly show that now work has become a free and and uh, um, a voluntarily or, or voluntary right and that's an aspect of capitalism i think which is ideologically very heavily promoted that contrary to what luigi just <laughs> uh, said many think that cap the, the freedom and cap capitalism means we have a sort of contract freedom right so um you as a laborer or as a laborer are free in the sense that you supposedly are free to choose your uh, your your position but of course as Luigi just pointed out, we are not free not to work, right? So we have to uh, submit to wage labor. And that's not a freedom, right? That's a, that's a necessity of the market, right? Okay, okay. so let's do this then. So before I, I, so I have a question about that, but maybe it's better to do this. Let's, uh, can we get a definition of socialism uh, from from both y'all, and then and then we'll we'll swing back to that because I, I do have a question about that. But but maybe it'll maybe part of it will get answered in your definition here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, socialism emerged as a reaction to capitalism, right? So what Luigi and I just underlined was that a very basic notion of freedom is a. Uh, heavily neglected in capitalism, namely a notion of freedom in a sense of personal autonomy or in a sense of self-realization, right? In a quite broad sense, right? On a psychological level, people tend to want to be autonomous in a sense that, that they don't, do not accept that um, they are um, subverted or submitted to, to uh, powers they do not accept themselves, right? But in capitalism, this, this is heavily the case, right? And so, this in itself, of course, very early on in the development of capitalism, created a sort of impulsive reactions among workers in England and so forth, and, 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 so, on, and so forth. But there was also very heavy um, influence from the French Revolution, for instance, in the uh, transfer of Enlightenment ideas concerning personal autonomy, freedom, uh, liberty, and equality from this very movement. And socialism then try to um, stabilize this, uh, this um, how shall I say, impulsive reaction of workers in England above all into a sort of more organized form. And its main key idea was to uh, realize these uh, demands which the French Revolution, at least theoretically, uh, had uh, um, on its shield under the, under the uh, condition of capitalism with the further aim, of course, to supplant capitalism with, not, with, with a different system where these values can be fully realized. And socialism itself is a very rich and pluralistic tradition. It starts about really in the 1820s, I would say, in England above all, for obvious reasons. Two angles. On the one hand, we had a sort of uh, theoretical development where intellectuals or um, philosophers or university professors elaborated socialist ideas and theories. Um, which always had sort of a tripartite structure, namely uh, what's the situation we are in and uh, what's the situation we want to get to and uh, how can we get from where we are to where we want to get. Yeah. Um, and on the other hand, there was a, as I said, the, 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 these ideas stabilized the indignation among workers. And so workers started to uh, get really organs or, um, or political parties 
and so on and so forth. And both uh, um, angles of socialism, so to say, always were in a very dynamic interrelationship. So the labor movement, as it's called, um, always informed practically somehow the theoretical uh, work of uh, the intellectuals and intellectuals themselves, of course, um, funneled, uh, channeled um, ideas from their own work to, uh, to the practical uh, attempts at realization. So as a basic outline of socialism. I mean, of course, the, the, the main proponent many people have in mind of socialism is the Marxist socialism. Um, yeah, but there are many more so theories. Can, can you elaborate on that? Because that because one of the things I'm hearing is right, you're you're emphasizing freedom and, and liberty as an essential element in socialism, right? And and people from will we'll say from right of center perspectives hear socialism and they hear Marx and they hear communism and they hear right centralized state and things like that they, they don't they don't picture liberty and freedom so can you elaborate on uh these other these other versions or or these other angles uh that are that are not marxian in uh or or at least di diverge from it in some way yeah i mean um the marxist uh, conception of course is the most elaborate one so the pre pre Marxist conceptions um, have several, um, how shall I say, there are several exegetical problems because they emerge um, uh, in, in a specific historical context, which sometimes is pre capitalist. So that's the case in France, where many ideas of the French Revolution were transformed and integrated. But of course, these theorists uh, didn't have the, a, a real capitalist situation. In front of them, right? That, that, that was in England, right? It was only Marx who somehow combined both things, right? Because he was uh, uh, for a long time uh, a resident of, of England and, um, and also Engels was there for a long time. And so he could integrate these bo both of these things, right? But okay, so let's see. Um, I mean, yeah, we have uh, a very strong um, uh, enlightenment conception of freedom in very early French so socialists, such as um, Grahus Babeuf, which is not that widely known, I think, um, who was originally a so-called feudist. So he his job was pre in pre-revolutionary France to um, somehow to seek through the uh, feudal law of France so that the noble class could somehow, um, yeah. Could somehow push up their 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 degree of exploitation, but Babeuf very soon then came into contact with the French revolutionaries and changed radically his own way of thinking. I mean, here again, ideas are not really really that um, 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 quite uh, strictly formulated, but Babeuf um, understood freedom as I get it at least, um, as I already uh, said, as a sort of um, absence of non-justified autonomy also maybe in a sort of, of Kantian way, so that you accept only that these, how shall I say, these social pressures or restrictions, which you can uh, justify rationally, right? That's somehow maybe a core element of Babeuf. Again, Babeuf was not a really educated man, so he had some trouble in expressing these things properly. And yeah, I mean, and, and then of course, Babeuf uh, tried to, uh, um, channel these ideas uh, in the uh, French Revolution itself. He, he was part of that and then uh, was somehow caught up with the uh, turmoil, which then happened, yeah. So that's a, one example of that, right? Um, we still have, I think, in France, um, let me see, uh, Auguste Blanqui, who was a sort of, yeah, how shall we denote him as a sort of, uh, I think, Historians classify him as a sort of revolutionary anarchist in some sense, but again, Blanqui was not very specific about his own ideas. He was, like Babeuf, more interested in, in transformation strategies. But again, we have here the same ideas, right? Uh, so in a quasi quasi Kantian sense, freedom is again conceptualized as the absence of non-justified, rationally non-justified uh, restrictions. Um, and of course, Blanqui has the advantages compared to uh, uh, to Barbeuf that he worked in the uh, what was it eighteen 
I think 1850 something, right? So where 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 France was approaching more or less a rather capitalist uh, um, status, but was still very uh, um, imprinted by by feudalism. Yeah. So these, I, I would say, these are some of the key um, precursors to Marx himself in this respect. Okay, L Luigi, did you want to uh, add anything to that, or? Yeah, Luigi could talk about the, the uh, what's it called, the uh, Carbonari. I should. <laughs> what I will um, and say. Buonarotti. Man, Buonarotti and Babus, you should say something completely dangerous humans. <laughs> well, uh, what I would like to add on the part that you discussed right now is that there are some pretty extreme differences between capitalism and socialism, which maybe should be pointed out and discussed. For instance, we have officially a certain principle of competition meaning in the most strict sense that we have a certain system in which the private businesses compete to provide consumers with goods and so on and so forth. They should be better, faster. We know all about that. But in socialism, as a contrast, um, there is not really competition in the sense we know it. There is rather a certain form of cooperation with each other in producing the goods needed for the society. And it's pretty radical because if we line that out in its, in its um, basic meaning, at the end, what we have in a socialist society, or at least what we, what we should have, is that people produce in a, certain, some, certain, in a certain sense, a social product in which everyone who contributes, contributes to the production of the good is entitled to a share of it. And that conflicts pretty heavily with what we know in capitalism. So what's your idea about such differences, Walter and also I just, Jake, of just want to add that, uh, as I said, socialism is heavily pluralistic and what Luigi just pointed out is one strain of thought, right? There are many others which uh, even have some sort of capitalist leaning. Um, and we maybe should also point out that, at least from my angle, um, socialism, well, at least the so socialism since Marx, right, um, doesn't have really the intent to conceptualize a fully worked out a uh, new system, right? Because as we just said, its core values are democratic, right? And so it would be really hyperbolic and even um, authoritative or, or uh, autocratic somehow to pre pre prescribe a system which supposedly comes into being in the, in the nearer or further future. So uh, any such system of course must be developed and justified by the collective when uh, the uh, when when a true democracy is is established, right? Mm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, so that that gets us closer to the question I was going to ask. And but actually, maybe we'll get there if I ask a different question first, which is this. So now you've you've mentioned that uh, socialism right, it's pluralistic, right? Involves liberty, involves freedom, involves democracy. And then also some models have involved what might be considered an element of, of capitalism, okay? Um, some people basically say socialism goes straight to communism always, or that, that they're, they're, one is a, a, a lighter version of the other, right? Uh, what would you say to that? Or what is, is there a distinction between socialism and communism from your uh, framework? Yeah, I mean, communism is maybe even more heavily a, a, a debated term than, than socialism, above all, I think, in the US. Um, I mean, historically, we must distinguish at least three different uses of the term communism, I think. So we have a sort of pre-Marxist use of the term, we have a Marxist use of the term, and we have a post-Marxist use of the term, right? And so for each of these uses, which again, in themselves, are, again, 
quite uh, heterogeneous, we would have to um, ask the question how it relates to socialism as I, uh, as Luigi and I just outlined it. I mean, in, um, in pre-Marxist terms, um, communism is not a really properly defined doctrine. It emerges, for instance, again in France in the work of Charles Fourier, which is classified as a so-called utopian communist. And Fourier was very um, keen on outlining future societies um, in very great detail, even reaching or even outreaching to style of clothing or clothes or, or, or manners of, of, of eating and so on and so forth. But what he maybe, what he apparently meant by communism, so he, he thought that these societies should be communist. What he meant by communism is that there's a sort of, um, um, how shall I put it, uh, state-driven or state-regulated economy where uh, the access to the means of production as well as the distribution of uh, products is, is centrally regulated, right? So, but what he left open, of course, is how this regulation or what he left open is how these um, administrat administrative or political processes are to be justified. So he did not say that much about the nature of the of the justification. Is it democratic or is it rather a sort of oligarchic system? These are things he left open. So if we have a sort of, uh, if you address these heavy uh, normative readings of the term communism in the US, we can't really say if it's now leading to a sort of Stalinism or something, right? Because uh, Fourier uh, didn't say so. But let's say it, it, it just, doesn't look that democratic, okay? So, so in this sense, of course, um, as Fourier outlines, communism, socialism is certainly not communist, right? Um, if we, as I said, fill in some gaps in, in Fourier. So Marxist uh, terminology, if we restrict to the writings of Marx and Engels themselves, uh, communism is of course a, a stage in the, um, in the uh, development of human history according to Marx and Engels, so we have this uh, succession of several, uh, how shall we put it, uh, um, stages of civilization. Um, what's it called in English, actually? Uh, uh, um, a sort of ur-communism, -communis uh, so the very, very early form of communism in prehistory. Um, then we have feudalism, slavery, and then we have capitalism. And then from capitalism on, in the Marxist um, perspective, uh, history itself, due to its dialectical uh, nature, um, the, um, expands to or transforms into transforms capitalism itself into socialism. That's the um, that's the state of of civilization where uh, the means of production are collectivized, and then finally communism, as you as, as some think, final stage of of uh, history according to Marx, where then all class class distinctions uh, disappear, right? Um, I don't think actually that Marx uh, held that history has a sort of final point, but um, I think that with communism, Marx thought that history does not evolve by via um, um, uh, contradictory forces. So it's not, not a dialectical process anymore. But of course, this is a notion of communism now, according to Marx, that Again, it's not really that explicitly formulated. It's mainly uh, formulated in, in the uh, pamphlet um, of the Communist Party. But in its broad outline, it seems compatible with, with, uh, uh, with democratic values. I mean, there's no reason why we should say that in a democracy or in socialism, um, for, the, for that matter, uh, there should be any class distinctions, right? I mean, it can be that uh, class distinction always there in a human society, but um, as, uh, as regards democracy or socialism as its overarching realm, I don't see why uh, there should be any tension here, right? Okay, then we have, of course, the uh, notorious, more notorious um, post-Marxist use of the term communism, and that's uh, mainly the uses uh, which are related to Bolshevism and Stalinistic uses. And of course, these are uses which are um, uh, quite explicitly um, of a sort of autocratic nature where as Lenin explicitly held in communism, there should be a sort of one party state, which has a sort of autocratic stature, uh, commanding uh, and regulating economy from top down and also quite explicitly um, 
determining the uh, the, the the options of of social or uh, personal interactions of, of of citizens, right? So of course that's not compatible with socialism as I see it, right? So to summarize, pre-Marxist uses are with some uh, qualms uh, maybe uh, compatible with socialism. Marxist uses certainly, yeah. And post-Marxist, if we restrict them to a Bolshevist uses, are certainly not compatible, I would say. Okay, so and then so and what makes the post-Marxist uh, uh, version um, not compatible? This ultimately has to do with the role or lack thereof of democracy and its uh, supplantation by state or uh, yeah. mechanisms, autocratic. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what Lenin outlined quite explicitly is a sort of oligarchy, right? Where some minor group uh, uh, organize society. It was quite explicit, but I mean, Lenin officially thought that this is just a sort of trend, but I mean, still it's not compatible, right? So not to mention, of course, Stalinist conceptions, right? Mm. Would you add anything to that, Luigi, or anything uh, to note? Actually, to this topic, I am not adding something. If you're fine with that, we could move on, but if you have any specific detail uh point about communism we could maybe discuss it okay i mean yeah I, mainly i just want to make sure I, I get you in every round um but maybe i can ask i can pose this question to you so um so i heard walter say that um that marx's philosophy uh could be compatible with socialism the post-marxist versions the stalinist maoist versions are not because of their use of the state in an authoritarian manner was, is there not a quote from marx that basically where he says that at the end of this dialectical exchange that he, it's the we will have the dictatorship of the proletariat doesn't that kind of are there way i guess way to no way to ask question are, are there ways in which is it can be compatible with the stalinist and the maoist sort of uh, state-run communism so who are you asking now, Luigi or me? I was, I was posing it to Luigi if he, okay. uh, if you want to um, chime in when he's done or if he doesn't uh, have a, a whole lot to say about it, you know, you can take that question up. But Yeah, I mean, I can try to say something about it. But before I do that, I would like to ask Walter first if this uh, quote from Marx is a clear one or it's one which has to be interpreted because if I interpret it like in a more uh, radical democracy kind of attitude that the sovereign people actually would create the state in the sense leaving apart the term dictatorship then I could answer it but if it's like a a, a quote which is thought about uh, with a lot of uh, implemented wars on the on the meaning, I would have to pass it to Walter. So we should Walter can maybe hear that. If before we answer that question, we should be, maybe talk about the term dictatorship here, right? Because of uh, um, in the retrospect, many people think of the term dictatorship as something analogous to, uh, say, a Stalinist system or a system uh, as in Hitler or Germany. But of course, these systems were not in existence uh, or were, were not conceptualized during the um, 18th, uh, during the 19th century. So what Marx most probably had in mind was a sort of system which he himself called Bonapartist or Caesar-like. So it's a, something like a system uh, from, from the outer appearance that uh, um, resembles maybe the um, regime which um, which was um, upheld uh, after 1848 by uh, Louis Bonaparte, Napoleon III. That's maybe what he meant by dictatorship, but um, so it doesn't have anything to do with some sort of concentration camps or mass murder or something like the Schutzstaff of the SS or something, right? Um, it's rather quite moderate way of uh, autocratic regime. So, but we, we are not sure, of course, of if, if Marx really meant that term. I, I'm just outlining the way the, the term dictatorship was used in Marx uh, times, right? 
uh, what Luigi just pointed out may be the case. Um, as I read Marx here concerning dictatorship of the, uh, the uh, proletariat, um, I mean, one certainly may see it as a sort of, uh, as Marx saw it as a sort of inter-regime phase where workers overtake power from the, um, how shall I say, ruling classes, and then in a sort of after turmoil establish a true democracy. That may be one reading, right? But again, this uh, pamphlet of Marx and Engels is highly ambiguous, and I wouldn't mm, lay too much weight on these things here, right? These are, these are, these are rather uh, trigger terms, which are mostly used as a sort of, um, I don't know, not really rationally based debate of, 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 uh, of Marxism or communism, right? So I would suggest stepping rather to Marx's more theoretical works and not to these uh, rather more uh, uh, political pamphlets, which were re really written for the, uh, for, for, for the daily life of politics, right? Okay, and so um, so that better way to address this then is, and this is where I, this was that one question that I said I had a long time ago. Um, so let's talk about then, right? Because I'm hearing you say two things in principle, regardless of how we define capitalism, socialism, communism, and that is that in the ideal state, which you are you are framing as socialist, um, there's a certain amount of freedom. And there's a certain amount of restriction on state autocracy, right? So then, uh, maybe right where where these dialogues, you know, sort of go into the weeds is when we talk about these terms like dictatorship or the proletariat or some of these other buzzwords that right are are um, come with a lot of baggage, right? And a, and a lot of mm -hmm. other stuff attached to it, right? So let's just talk about. The, the state, and I think I think you probably want to define what we mean by the state first, but then we'll talk, let's talk a little bit about like what is the function or the role of the state in a socialist society that does not move towards this, um, you know, into the, the communist Stalinist type of um, political system. So can, so can you start us off with like define the state and then hmm. what do you, what do you see as the appropriate function of that yeah again i mean the term of state is always part of a larger political theory in this case a sort of theory of democracy um when we turn to the uh, theories of radical democracy which uh, are informed by the european enlightenment then state here of course means the um the apparati which have the mon monopoly in power, so uh, the executive power and the, uh, what's it called in English, Jesus, judicious, judicious power, so the whole realm of judges and so on and so forth, where laws are applied to um, individual cases. Um, yeah, and this entity or these entities, as I said, have the monopoly in power, they apply law to uh, specific cases and in a true democracy, uh, especially the executive branch has just actually one legitimatized uh, role, namely to, um, to somehow uh, protect the individual spheres of freedom of individual citizens from each other by maybe coercive means. And the uh, judges and so on have the main task of um, applying law to specific cases just to uh, regulate um, interferences between these same uh, individual spheres of freedom. And, and that's, ju that's just, just that in a, in a democracy, right? Concerning what the state is, right? But what's crucial in democracy, of course, is that this so-called state has, is, is in, its, in its whole range of uh, possible interventions is fully and totally programmed as it were determined by the law and by a sort of constitution. And this law and this constitution are continually constructed, deconstructed, reconstructed in democratic processes which are issued by the people or by an entity which is fully controlled by the people. So we have in a true democracy, basically, and that's, and that's just actually what a, a state in a democracy is, we have two opposing 
elements on the one hand, we have a sort of non-divided um, legislative function, which is, uh, issues laws and um, constructs, reconstructs a, a sort of constitution. And this entity fully determines the apparatus of the state, which have the uh, full monopoly in power, right? So then um, how does that state, well, maybe, like, maybe I should ask this first. So when you say, so democracy in a socialist state, should this be like a, a pure democracy where you have like the rabble majority vote, 51% of a vote of the, the total mass or whatever holds the weight of law in the state or would it be something more representative with uh, perhaps local jurisdictions based on uh, local local communities and things like that? I mean, what I just outlined is a rather broad restriction. I mean, what you are addressing are quite specific implementation questions. And these are, of course, questions which always have to be decided by the people uh, in their very specific historic situation. I mean, as far as I am concerned, I think both ways could be uh, compatible with uh, the restrictions which are imposed by a true democracy. There are several um, options, I think. Uh, both ways may, 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 may be workable. It depends on the will of the people and their um, respective situation. So the reason why I ask is because I think that um... I think that the, the way to uh, reform or otherwise revolutionize capitalism in a way that achieves the things that you're talking about, which is freedom uh, of the people and restriction or certain restriction of the state, uh, that those mechanisms are important. And, you know, obviously, like you could, you know, I mean, you could just, uh, you know, poll. The people in a, in a given situation, but let's just use the example of like pure democracy, right? Where you have 51% of the people vote to take 49%, there are the other 49%'s rights for whatever, whatever rights it might be for whatever collective purpose that the rest of them sees as most beneficial for this particular community. Like, like to me, that's not, that does not, a, that is not protecting the freedom of the people, right? I mean, 5149 is not, right? I mean, it's, it's a majority, but it's, I mean, you're, it's a hugely significant portion of the, the, the people, right? The proletariat, the working class people who are now subject to the state outside of what they desire and what their will is. So, um, so, I'm, so, I, so I guess there, I'm also asking that uh, to figure out how, demo, how you implement the democratic process in a way that appropriately checks or regulates the state as the state regulates um, the rest of you know the commerce and you know the civil sphere. So I think there are several questions here. I'm not quite sure. So one sub question I think is what role electoral processes play in a true democracy? Is that right? Okay. And another question seems to be. Uh, <clears throat> in what way individual freedoms of, of citizens are protected in a true, true democracy, assuming that there are somehow majority processes for uh, collective decision justification, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, both, both okay, okay, okay. Well, <clears throat> okay. I mean, the role of electoral processes, yeah, I, I'm, maybe I was too quick um, before about that. Um, I mean, if we again, start from the historical concepts of, of true democracies as they issue in, say, Kant or Rousseau, uh, electoral processes play a really quite minor role, if not a totally absent role. The basic idea, if you read Kant, for instance, is that the way uh, laws or constitutions are issued or constructed by the people is in a highly complex and coordinated discursive process, right? So in a, to, to break it down quite roughly, uh, people get together and discuss matters, right? Uh, but in a way which is highly organized and highly formalized. So these are processes, according to Kant at least, which uh, somehow reflect the properties which the law has to have in order to count as 
a democratic law, namely freedom of expression, for instance, in a, in a, in a discursive process, or equality concerning the access of the relevant information, and so on and so forth, right? And if we take these um, theses seriously, then of course, um, electoral processes as they are commonly conceived nowadays, um, well, um, at least not that fruitful for democracy because these of course are processes which are somehow, they heavily lack any discurs discursive element, right? They are just pro or con, but people do not get into a real interaction in a in a uh, free um, sphere of communication, right? So if you take, of course, the electoral process in this way, then it's not a good idea to implement it in, in, it in this way. That's for sure. But as far as I know, there are some theoreticians, and that's why I was quite quick before that uh, think that uh, in some way we could restructure electoral process in a way, but of course not in the way they are they are, they are common now. That's for sure, right? Okay. Um, in what way? I don't know. This is a quite um, difficult matter. Um, and your second question was about, uh, yeah, right, the uh, protection of, uh, of of rights of people, right? Um, this again um, relates to the nature of the um, generation of of laws and and constitutions in a true democracy. In the ideal case, um, as Kant said, even a folk of or even a people of devils will will produce only democratic uh, laws in a in a democracy, right? So the basic idea is, according to Kant, that these processes are structured in such a way that even malign, um, malign intentions or bad intentions of people cannot pass through, right? That's a heavily, of course, very very ambitious claim, but that's the claim of a true, true democracy. Um, but there are ideas how one could uh, implement such ideas, for instance, by the uh, eminent German uh, um, uh, political philosopher Ingeborg Maus. Maus um, uh, tries to transfer some ideas of, of John Rawls about the, um, what was his, his name, the whale of, of, of non-knowledge or what he, what, what was it called, right? Uh, to these electoral processes. And her idea is that in a democratic system, in the sense of Kant, um, there are several layers, so to speak, of blindness, right? So if a people begins to construct, for instance, a constitution, right? None of the constructor knows how uh, the, who will benefit from the upcoming laws which, are, which may be based on that constitution, right? Because the laws are not there, okay? And then we have a sort of constitution. The constitution in the sense of a true democracy uh, somehow is, the, is a fully, let's put it, uh, let's say a formal framework, which uh, lays down the formal properties a process has to obey in order to generate a law. So it's not a catalog of individual rights like in the US or like in Germany. That's a bad idea, according to Rousseau and Kant, and now we see why, <laughs> at least in Germany. But uh, these are very formal processes which regulate, in some way, how laws uh, have to be constructed. And then when it comes to the construction of laws, a second layer of blindness comes in, namely the same entities which constructed the constitution, con construct the laws, um, but they do not know the individual cases these laws will be applied to, because laws in Kant's sense are always general. That's the nature or it's the only realm of occupation the people is allowed to uh, access the realm of a general laws, right? And then we have, of course, of course, a sort of third level of blindness when it comes to the executive powers, because they are only allowed to regulate individual cases, right? They cannot, somehow uh, uh, modify the general aspects of, of law, right? And that's uh, one way of implementing this idea that, um, that, that individual freedoms are, are protected. Of course, your question can also be uh, 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 looked upon as the question how um, uh, the citizens are protected from the state itself, right? That's another sort of protection question. So we, had, we just had the discussion about how can it will be protected from the um, legislation, actually, right? Now we have the question how 
people can be uh, protected from the from the uh, state. And that's uh, here comes in what I just uh, mentioned, namely that the uh, law totally programs the uh, the, the uh, executive powers, right? So every aspect of the uh, of, of of actions the executive powers may take is fully fully determined by um, by by laws and by the constitution, and they are not allowed in any way to interfere with the production of laws, right? Contrary again to the U.S. Constitution, contrary to our own constitution, if we have one, I don't know. But Luigi, do you want to jump in? Well, well, this was highly detailed, so let me see what I could eventually add to this. Um, I mean, of course, this goes in a way straight to the basis of socialism as socialism is deeply about the realization or at least at least the the ide ideologically uh, that the focus lies exactly on the topic which Walter just just uh, formulated out so we actually have to understand the connection from the socialist movement, be it the labor movement or the early 1820s, 30s movement with Goodwin and so forth. We have to understand that, that as the urge to realize um, such democratic behavior into society. So that's, um, I try to, to point out those lineage, lineages for my purpose in the extremely uh, detailed um, form in which Walter did is uh, enough for me at this point. Yeah, I, so oh. I, I, um, I like how you, how you guys broke down the question into different spheres. And so I, I agree that, right, d democracy and the elections, right, the, the democratic process, like you can see it in, you know, over here, just to use a, uh, the, the example that I'm living in right now, which is um, at a certain level, I don't know what that noise is out there. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's a lot of noise in here. I apologize. But um, dogs and uh, somebody's mowing their lawn or something out there, I don't know. Um, there's no voting our way out of this. Now, I'm not saying that, right, we don't need laws and a, and a legal process and, and things like that. But, you know, the, the corruption is such that at this point that in order for us to get those laws reformed in a way that is going to service us. It's not just it's not just to go to the ballot box and vote, right? Like there, there has to be some sort of grassroots organization, some sort of whether they be boycotts or strikes or whatever. Uh, but but that's the democratic process, and that and in a certain level, it is separate from the the legislative process. Um, as you broke down. Uh, the different layers of blindness when it comes to writing uh, laws and then in, and then implementing them. Um, I guess I have another. I guess I have another question, and that, and that would be like, are there are there any like like over here we have our Bill of Rights, and there's there's some of those are like freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, right? Like now. To use freedom of, of speech and to use your example, right? We, I don't think anybody ever thought that corporations would be able to use the First Amendment to have uh, the right to pay an unlimited amount to lobby for politicians and elections and things like that. That's right. Like the freedom of speech is used to basically support uh, unlimited spending campaigns for companies. And now all of a sudden, you know, on social media, we're not allowed to we're not allowed to have conversations. But, but the but I, I guess my question is: Are there at least some principles such as rights to privacy, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, rights to self defense? Like, are those are are those rights that maybe maybe to, to whatever degree there's a blind spot? Um, is that blind spot small enough where where you could say that that would be a, ne a, a necessary? right that should be codified in a socialist state 
Well, this relates to the question, um, what role normative contents play with regard to a constitution? Um, here we have, of course, to emphasize what I just said, that uh, according to the theories of democracies, uh, which came with Kant and Rousseau, the idea is that a constitution should never ever contain normative contents. They should really only contain structural process conditions, as it were, right? Because, you know, the problem with putting in contents like free speech or something like that into a constitution is that when times change like they do now, or like they are doing now, and, and it can very well happen that these same normative contents are used as weapons against the people, right? So it's very easy, for instance, in Germany uh, to restrict these normative contents in ways which um, are uh, in favor of the ruling classes. And as the, uh, as the uh, systems of legislation in Germany and also in the US, of course, in the hands of the ruling classes, they have an easy time of formulating these normative contents, contents in, a, in, in a very imprecise way so that there are a lot of, or shall I say, conceptual gaps in it so that it's possible, as you just pointed out, all of a sudden to treat persons uh, or to treat uh, companies as persons, right? Because the notion of a person is not defined in the constitution, right? That's what I mean, you see? And that's a, that's a, a tendency in the development of, of law, which again, in Ingeborg Maus has always stressed very heavily. We have since the, let's say, beginning of the 19th, uh, uh, sorry, uh, beginning of the, uh, the 20th century, uh, we can observe a process of what she calls refutalization of law, right? And that's a global phenomenon, mo mostly in the Western hemisphere, but it's a global phenomenon. And what this process amounts to is that the form of law, um, as I just pointed out, all, contains gaps, uh, imprecise terms, which can then be situatively be filled in by the judges when apparently just applying the law, but what they indeed do then of course is creating a law, right? And as these systems of, uh, of, of law application are in the hands of the ruling classes, ruling classes can just get their uh, intentions through while having the whale of democracies uh, uh, led over all these uh, things. Um, and what this leads to, and that's what she um, specifically addresses as uh, the refoilization process, is that companies and the ruling um, actors of um, capitalist systems can situatively create their own laws, and in a way that they can, by these so-called laws, control the people. Right. And so, and and so you're saying that. So, so it sounds like what you're saying is but, that, but, yeah. Go ahead. yeah, but your point was, of course, uh, where does these uh, notions like freedom, uh, freedom of speech and so on come in, right? So um, knowing these things also and Kant uh, um, uh, had uh, as their, one of the key presuppositions, the notion that there are natural rights like freedom of expression, if you like some property rights or uh, freedom of movement, freedom of life or security of life, what have you. And the idea of Kant was that we, in a true democracy, we have a sort of double nature of freedom, right? On the one hand, we have these uh, extra, extra uh, constitutional forms of natural rights, which lay before every creation of a state or of any constitution. Um, and when a people uh, is constituted by whatever procedure, uh, this entity takes these positive natural rights, as it were, and according to the respective historic situation, can interpret or reinterpret it, and then formalize it in a highly explicit way by the mentioned uh, um, uh, highly formal uh, procedures into laws, but in a way that are not formulated in a positive manner, but in a negative manner, right? And mostly, as I said, in a structural manner, that's the actual ideal, which is not always that uh, easy, but um, some theorists think it can be done. And then we have a quite intricate structure, namely um, the, this guarantees that the, that, that the people can always, according to its will, according to changing historic situations, can 
somehow um, grab these natural rights which lay outside any uh, uh, state uh, construction and reconsider the constitution itself and can refill in the whole constitution, re uh, remade it as, as it were, right? Yeah, and then and then by this constitution again uh, control the um, executive powers in a new way. So that's the somehow roughly put the way uh, these positive freedoms come into play. They're never part of the actual um, codification of the law, but they are always there as the central basic normative resource of the law. But but they must be outside. But, so, but they, should, they should be outside, but they should be. Um acknowledged and and real and and functionally manifests however imperfectly through the the structural laws that that you would the, yeah. the, the democracy okay yeah. i mean so, these so, structural yeah these, these structural laws are somehow in a sense are just manifestations of these positive law uh, rights right but they must be made in a way that it cannot be abused in case um certain things happen right that's a basic idea yeah. and so what you're saying is that you you that the democratic process codifies the natural rights in a structural way is in a way that is flexible depending on the historical situation uh and that it, in the instance in which those codified laws become corrupted either by the corporations or the state that the the grassroots type of democracy that I mentioned, organizing, striking, that's where those natural rights are manifest, despite the fact that the law or the, the economic situation has co-opted them or bastardized them or somehow or, or tried to, to reframe them to, to coerce uh, obedience to, to the state or the economy. Is that, does, does that sound like I'm summarizing what you're saying in a yeah, sense. Basically. But what of course must be underlined is such such a system as I've just um contoured uh, is of course entirely incompatible with capitalism, right? So if this system were realized, there would be no uh, uh, companies or uh, what, what what folks ever that uh, could try to cooperate uh, to to uh, to to somehow undermine the system, right? Because capitalism, uh, as we just pointed out before, uh, brings with it certain power asymmetries and economic asymmetries, which are entirely incompatible with uh, the uh, stabilization of uh, these formal procedures necessary for issuing uh, democratic laws. Radically incompatible. Right, but 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 you still have the danger or the the possible pitfall yeah. of so you, you've got the you've got yeah. the the power of capitalism regulated or unchecked, but then you still have the other clip to watch out for, which is that with those blind spots through those mm. democratic processes that the state can, could, could uh, develop into something over time that is akin to, to something that is, that is Stalinist. So, so maybe it's not like a capitalist manifestation where, where, where the rights are um, destroyed or co-opted, but but they could still be right through through that oligarchic state state uh, centralized form of like a communism, like like that could still be a danger if you if if these natural rights were not recognized outside of the democratic process. Is that a is that fair? Yeah, but I'm not sure if you're suggesting that a democracy, if implemented, could transform itself into a Stalinist system, or if your claim is that it could be sort of exterior powers which could, from the external, somehow uh, transform it. What is your well, take on that? Yeah, yeah, and I think that would depend on when, what type of democracy, right? Would it be, like, I think a pure democracy where popular vote is the mechanism versus one that has representatives, right? That, like, in the latter, the representatives could, right, them being a, a, an effective minority that can control various, you know, um, uh, communities and, and groups of, of voters, right, that, um, that that could become an, an autocratic situation. But at the same time, right, um, you know, again, if you have 51 percent 
voting out voting the, the other 49 i don't see that as really like you know when we talk about democratic which i'm representing all the people that's not representing all the people either so i, I guess in, in both ways without without the proper uh checks and balances in terms of those natural rights and some firewalls in terms of the democratic process that yeah i i, I do see that um you know, whether it be the, the representatives sort of becoming little oligarchs or just mob rule of, you know, a, a majority, uh, a, a, a small majority, right? Not like 90, 10. And, and even then, right? I mean, you know, I think the rights of the smallest minority, right? I mean, uh, should, should be protected in a, in a truly democratic society. That's, that's my, my position. Yeah. <clears throat> So your take is that there are ways or conceivable ways in which a so-called true democracy could evolve into a sort of autocratic system, right? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I might move the, the word true from out in front of it, but but let's just say that processes so in a sense, I just that are, it. yeah, yes, the, the electoral, well, maybe a better one, because you did, you did distinguish the electoral process from the types of grassroots democracy that I mentioned in terms of like the labor organizing. So but maybe we should say that uh, the electoral process, but you know, there, there's, there's a point at which all these things come together, right? There's a point at which the grassroots organizing, right? Gets enough weight where it can affect the voting process or where it can influence the representatives, right? But the other, you know, it can work the other way as well, right? And, and so it has to do ultimately with, uh, almost like which group is the most popular uh, or, you know, which, which representatives are the most persuasive, right. And can convince you to maybe go along with some, some laws or policies that, that undermine those natural rights or the, or the mob undermines those natural rights, right. The, the 51%. Now, maybe that's not a true democracy, but it, but right. It's using what are considered democratic processes uh, and there, it's not, it's not controlled, wielded, or participated in enough by the people on the ground to actually, right, come out in their favor, I guess. And I think, I think the way to prevent that veering off in that direction ultimately does have to do with how we, how we can codify, however imperfectly, certain natural rights. Yeah, I mean, these voting procedures you just outlined are um as I get them right, uh, taken from uh, electoral processes as they are conceived nowadays. And uh, as I said before, um, I do not think that these processes are in any way compatible with democratic processes as I, 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 as I understand them, right? Because I do not see any minimally discursive element in that. And what's more, all these processes, of course, take place in a highly, um, in a highly manipulated cognitive context due to say corporate propaganda or whatever right um so it's very very far away from any uh, structural democratic processes as I, I just outlined them so even if you're right um it would wouldn't be a sort of counter example yeah i just i you know um and even what's more just to add that um a, a, a sort of, let's say, uh, uh, just a, a voting procedure is actually the opposite of a discursive process, right? Because a discursive process is a exchange of arguments based on a rationally given a set of information, right? And so these, these, these emphasis, uh, this emphasis on, on voting procedures, I think has largely, largely distorted the perception of, of the basic, um, uh, foundations of a true democracy, right? Because of, of course, I mean, in, if you just let the people vote, uh, 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 then we can have situations as you just outlined, right? That's quite fair enough. Yeah, and, but but I, not, just, and I would add one more thing, or it's, so I don't know, I don't know if it's a comment or a question, it's a mixture of both. Uh, and that is this. Um, so even in that discursive process of exchange between, right, working people on the ground, like when it's finally translated into collective action, isn't there always some kind of a 
voting process for lack of a better term, right? I mean, like people are exchanging ideas and we're all exchanging ideas, but at what point do we all get together and go, hey, we're all striking today and this is how we're going to do it. So um, that I think like the, the, the point at which the discursive exchange becomes implemented through the state, right? Through the legal, the legal channels and the civil process, whatever that might be, um, right? I mean, in a democ, in, in anything that's a, a democracy or you know, a representative republic, it has to be, right? There has to be a voting process in order to translate the discursive exchange into, to sort of um, glean out, right? What we're actually agreeing on, right? Oh, why should there's there lots be, of data points going back and forth, isn't it? Yeah, but why should there uh, by necessity be a, a election process or a, a, sorry, a, a voting process? Well, I, I mean, mean, yeah, sorry. especially when, you know, the, the, the larger the group gets in, in particular, right? I mean, if you're representing, you know, let's say, you know, all the teachers at my school, right? Um, like, how do we know that, how do you get everybody's opinions galvanized around a, a singular action? Just, you know, uh, I mean, it could be a multi-pronged uh, oh, okay. front, yeah, but you know what I mean? Like how yeah, yeah. it has to, how do we know <laughs> that we that we heard everybody and how do we know that we didn't leave anybody out if we don't all say, look, this is the thing we're going to do and what do you all think about it and tally, tally those discursive uh, exchanges in some way? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. I think there we must distinguish between two notions of a uh, voting process, um, namely a voting process which has a sort of justificatory uh, function, so which issues uh, as a result the uh, corresponding law and justifies it. Uh, and on the other hand, we have a sort of, how should I say it, information channeling function which uh, just has the function of sending a sort of uh, collectively or subcollectively generated decision onto a larger structural level, right? I think the latter function of, uh, so, yeah, yeah, the latter function of, of uh, voting is entirely compatible with democracy, but the first not. And the only way, yeah, I mean, what you are referring to are um, local decision procedures. And there, I think it's quite obvious that these uh, um, voting practices have this information channeling function but not mainly a justificatory function, right? But on the common systems which we have in play on, on the more global, uh, more federal politics say, uh, these are um, at least thought to be uh, justificatory functions, right? And that's not, in, not, not compatible, I think. So voting processes in a true democracy should have only a sort of, or shall I say, administrative function to, to gather information. Because as you rightly pointed out, the problem of course is, as, um, as societies get uh, more complex and the information get more complex, we have a sort of integration problem, right? So we have people on the ground, as you put it, which gather information, process it. And of course they cannot come all together <laughs> at once. Uh, they have somehow to be uh, split up in subgroups or something. And each of these subgroups has their own way of inquiry and uh, reaches a conclusion. And then these conclusions have to be projected up uh, a, a more, on a more uh, complex level, right? I mean, there is some work by, um, what's your name? Again, a German scholar, Heidrun Adumait, uh, which uh, has research on these topics concerning the uh, election processes in the EU, EU the, the uh, European Union. And she has some models on how this could work. But again, in her opinion, these are only uh, to be uh, voting processes which have this information channeling function. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed the first half of this interview. For uploading purposes, I had to cut it into two parts. So to catch the second half of this interview, please check out part two. Thanks so much. Peace. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share. If you'd like to check out more of my research, go to my website, schoolworldorder.info, where you can find archives of all my interviews, all my articles and a bibliography of all my citations. There's also links to all my social media and video platforms. And you can sign up for my email list too, where you will receive notifications whenever I produce a new article, interview, or video. To support my work, 
Become a research member for just $5 a month, and you'll gain access to my WebBrain database, which contains Charlotte Thompson Iserbeet's archive of U.S. Department of Education files and other rare historical documents. Database will be updated with weekly document dumps, and you will be notified whenever I upload a new dossier. Thanks again for watching. Peace.